Thanks, hey, Nora. I'm excited to talk to you guys today, guys today about, about social media. media. Uh, so, uh, so, so my name is Dr. Kromhoff. I'm, I'm a licensed psychologist. I'm the director of clinical services here at the Center for Change. And I've been here for 17 years. I've been treating eating disorders for the past 20 years. And I specialize in body image. I run a lot of body image um, classes. I have a week here. And for those of you that have seen me speak um, before, you know I've been traditionally on the media, and, and that's what I've been on. So I'm going to talk about that first, and then we're going to dive right into social media. So my research that I did years and years ago was looking at how traditional media triggers women, and we know it, in general it leads to increased depression, anxiety, body dissatisfaction. In women with eating disorders, it really increases their body dissatisfaction. So I decided to start looking at social media and see how that impacted women. And I just want to talk, um, review Dr. Becker's study really quick because I am going to be talking about Dr. Becker's most recent research when it comes to social media. But those of you that aren't familiar with Dr. Becker's research, she's Harvard sociologist. She's looked at um, the people of PG for decades, and she found that just after three years of doing um, our media, they had the same rates of eating disorders as they did in Manhattan. So I want you to keep that in mind when we talk about her most recent research looking at social media. Because now I feel like things have really, really changed. In the past, you know, our kids were watching TV, and, and if some of you have small children or even your clients, I think you know that they're, um, they're glued to their phones, they're on their iPads, they're on their computers. So what are social media sites? And um, a social media site should be you know, obvious anything that um, has any kind of social networking. So Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat. Yeah, kind of yeah, kind world, of world, YouTube, blog, blog online diaries. Diary. So when I talk blog, about social blog. media, that's what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, Nicole, we're just having some issues. So let's know we know okay. issues and we're we'll working on okay. it. So yeah, I guess we're having some sound issues. So I'll slow down for a minute and then we'll get those um, figured out. It seems really close. Maybe that's the problem. No, that's not it. So um, I thought a nice way to introduce myself is to show you guys, since you can't see me and it's kind of, uh, we're, we're all here online, I thought I would show you my online profile and take some pictures from my, my Facebook page and so you can kind of get to know me. So this is me right here and, and I'm at the spa and this is usually what I like to do every Saturday morning. I like to go to the spa, just relax. This um, um, next picture I'm going to show you. Let's see if it'll catch up. Okay, so um, we'll see if you guys can catch up here because you don't want to miss this picture of me because this is me at the beach. Sorry, my toenails are not painted, but this is me at Hawaii this year because I go to Hawaii every year and I like to rent this private island. So if you guys are going to Hawaii, you can reach out to me and I'll let you know. Um, how to get into uh, get this island. Uh, this next picture, this is my husband. Uh, and, um, uh, I know I'm very uh, young, uh, young, but he's but very he's nice. nice. This this next picture I'm going to show you is my son, and he, you know, he's very very accomplished. So these are a lot of his awards that he won, and he's doing really well. This final picture, and I'm sorry if there's some therapists. This, this picture, I, I'm sure this happens with you too. But every Monday when I come to work, this is what my desk looks like. Um, just because my patients are so appreciative of the work I do, and so I get flowers every week. So I show you all these pictures um, to kind of show you my social media is kind of a joke because that's obviously not my social media site. But I started looking at social media because I found that when I was going on Facebook and different sites like that, I found myself getting insecure and feeling not good enough because literally all my friends seemed to be going to Hawaii all the time. All their kids were winning awards and they all had the most fabulous husbands in the world and I thought, what is going on? And, and so I started wondering, do other people feel insecure like I do when they go on social media? So that's what sparked some of my interest. And, and we'll find what the research says. So this is my actual family. This is the best picture we could get. I say, well, at least the dog looks good in that picture because my son won't hold still. And 
I was kind of mad and my daughter's eyes were closed, but that's kind of the real, the real us. So I'm going to be talking about media use, in particular how much adolescents use the media and young adults. And then we're going to talk about the benefits and the risk of social media, because I do believe social media has a lot of benefits. And then we're going to talk about Facebook. And, um, you know, with the younger generation, they don't even use Facebook. But the reason I'm going to talk about Facebook is that's where most of the research has been focused on. As most of you know, research is always a couple years behind um, of what kind of where society is. And so there's some extensive research on Facebook and body image and disordered eating. And then we'll talk about healthy living blogs and pro sites. And then at the end, kind of as professionals, what we can do. For those of you that received a, an email version of my PowerPoint, there's some more information in that. That PowerPoint was originally an hour and a half, and so you will get some additional information in that. So let's first talk about kind of teens. A study in 2010 found that adolescents spend seven hours a day using media, television, computers, internet, or video games, or their cell phone. That they estimate that adolescents spend more time with the media than any other activity. I was reading a, a research article, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't strictly research, um, and so I didn't include that. But the most recent article I read said that adolescent girls in high school are spending up to 19 hours a day connected to technology. And after um, spending a weekend in a hotel room with my daughter sleeping next to her phone, I um, soon understood why, because her phone was going off every five minutes when she was getting Snapchats and kids are checking that and you know that they're, they're always connected to that technology. So research has always found also found if adolescents have a television or connected to social media in their bedroom, it increases chances of being overweight by 31%. They also report less sleep, having less hobbies and interests. And now adolescents are the defining users of the internet. And we're going to talk about that in a minute um, because there's such a marketing presence for them as well. When we look at um, media use with girls, they continue to still have the most blogs. Boys are usually avid video sharers, like on YouTube. Um, online boys are twice as likely um, as online girls to post videos. So boys, for example, will post videos of them doing things on trampolines or riding their bikes or or playing Pokemon Go or whatever it is, they're posting videos of them doing those kind of activities where girls are still traditionally kind of writing blogs or doing online journaling on these kind of sites. And then, of course, once they post a photo or a video, you know, all they want to do is sit and wait to see how many comments they have or how many views they have. And I know for a lot of my patients that if they don't get a certain amount of views, they'll pull the picture. So I had a patient tell me just last week, well, if I don't get um, 300 likes on my Instagram photo, then I pull it because obviously it's not good enough. And so then do teens and do they restrict their use? And unfortunately, they don't. So for most people, we can access what a lot of the young people are doing online. So 39% of them say that most of the time they access it. 38% said sometimes. And then 21% said they never restrict access. Um, and it's an interesting thing, even with my techs, the care techs that work here with the Center for Change, I talk to them about restricting their access because even for a lot of them, they have social media sites that they allow anyone to view. And I let them know that um, the patients will be viewing their sites. They will be looking at that information. So this study in uh, 2000 and seven, they found that 60% of, 64 percent of teens were online. And again, you can kind of look at some of the things they're doing online. 28 percent of them, for example, have online journals or blogs. And when I've asked my patients about this, they tell me that they don't block or restrict um, who can look at their journals and blogs. And as long as someone has their, their address and know how to, how to access it, they'll put their most personal details on the internet and they said they actually feel safer doing that than writing them down in a journal they would keep um, in their room. So I think it's really important to ask your patients, you know, are they keeping online blogs or journals? Who can view them? Are they restricting access? Again, on this next study I'm going to 
show you, kind of shows kind of percentage use of 71% of um, 12 to 17 year olds have cell phones, 38% use, you know, social or media to make online purchases, 28% get their health information. And that's the other thing that I've found, especially with this younger generation, they're, you know, researching everything about their eating disorder on social media, they're talking about it, and that's where they're getting their facts. And for them, if it's posted on a social media site, they really believe it's true. This next one I think is um, pretty funny. It says 77% of teens choose texting as the most common way relationships begin and end, and 82% report top way to end a relationship. So again, they're not like calling each other, they are just um, texting and ending their relationships. So these, these next ones show kind of a recent poll, 22% of teenage log into a site at least 10 times a day, 50% of teens are on a site um, every single day. Look at their cell phone use, and I think this is very interesting. 25% use their cell phones for social media, 54% use their cell phones for texting, and 24% use their cell phones for instant messaging. Do you notice that none of those percentages include talking on their cell phones? So they're using their cell phones, but not to talk to anyone. It's just all kind of connecting um, through texting, through instant messaging. Uh, this, this Girl Scout study, uh, 2010, they looked at 1,000 girls from age 14 to 17. And 74% yes. of the girls reported using social networking sites to make them look cooler than they really are. Kind of like what I did in the beginning, showing you my uh, Facebook pictures. You know, again, trying to make us look cooler than we are. The sad thing about this is this study found that girls were downplaying their intelligence and their kindness to seem cooler. So a lot of these girls felt like they needed to be mean they needed to be rude and that they couldn't be their, their real selves because that wouldn't be good enough. So to kind of summarize overall media use, we know there's 1 billion users on Facebook, 800 million on YouTube, 500 million on Twitter, and 10 million on Pinterest. So it really kind of shows you where people are using social media and the connections. So now we're going to talk about the benefits of social media because like I said, I do believe there's some really important things that can happen um, with social media. So the number one is, I think, community engagement, especially, you know, raising money for charities, for volunteering, and, of course, enhancing an individual's um, creativity or the collective creativity. So for a lot of people, it can be a great outlook or um, outlet to, you know, just express their ideas. Of course, we have blo blogs and podcasts and videos and there's a lot of a lot of great wonderful things people can do with social media if we look at this next one um, for of course for dating a lot of people can form relationships if you work with a non-traditional population I know a, a lot of my patients that are transgendered lesbian gay they use these sites they can be tremendously supportive to them for example I have even a friend that has a son with disabilities she uses social networking sites to connect with other moms with the same issues so they can be tremendously helpful and the good news for all of us is most teens surveyed who are regular media users have lots of friends get along with their parents and are happy at school so that was the 2010 study so even though I'm going to talk about a lot of the the negative things created with social media I do want to point out that there's lots of wonderful uses and for a lot of our patients, it can be a very helpful thing. We're just going to talk about at the end how to protect them, how to make sure it's okay for them. So let's talk about some of the risks. And um, I'm going to talk about some of the main ones I've seen um, with the eating disorder population. So the first one is, you know, cyberbullying. And 68% of girls nationally report that they've had a negative experience on social media. And, you know, I talk about it, and of course I'm older now, and I'll kind of date myself, but when I was, when I was younger, if, if someone didn't like me in school, literally the worst thing they could do to me is they could take a black Sharpie marker, and they could walk into the bathrooms, and they could write, Nicole sucks, or Nicole's ugly, or Nicole's fat, right? That, and that would be horrible, and the ten girls that walked in the bathroom stall after me would see that until the janitor cleaned it up. Well, now, with our pop, the patients we 
we work with, if someone doesn't like them, they can create an entire website design to say how ugly or fat or horrible that person is. And even high schools have social media sites to vote on the ugliest kid in school or the fattest kid in school. And so it becomes um, limitless on how kids can be bullied. And I've had several patients that have had to change schools because of the level of bullying they've received. But since it's all online, it just follows them from school to school. With Project Eat, they found that girls that reported being teased were two to three times as likely to binge eat and two times more likely to report unhealthy eating. 36% of girls that were teased by peers thought of suicide. 51% of girls that were um, reported that were teased by their peers and parents reported thoughts of suicide. So again, teasing hurts, being bullied hurts. Um, and you, it's, I think it's, as clinicians, it's critical that we ask our patients because a lot of times they don't like to tell us. They're ashamed, they're embarrassed, and so asking them if they've experienced this. The next one is um, sexting, and I think we all know what that is. Um, and, and kind of the ramifications of that. And a national sample of 1,500 um, 10 to 17-year-olds, 50% of the kids reported they had been exposed to online pornography. And I know even for my daughter last year when she was a freshman in high school, she had reached out to a boy. I think they started like instant messaging or whatever they do. And, and by the third instant message, he had asked her to send pictures of herself naked and she didn't even know him and she's so innocent she was horrified and immediately came and told me. Um, so luckily she talked to me but one of my other patients, this was a, a young woman, 16 year old in Florida that was struggling with an eating disorder. She had sent a young man a naked picture of herself. They were in a dating relationship when um, they broke up he uh, was very angry and upset with her, and he sent that out. I guess on their school, they have a school system that texts all the parents and all the students, and he sent that picture out to every parent and every child at that school. Now, of course, he, he faced huge consequences for that action, but of, my patient, too, was then um, left dealing with, with that, and it and it obviously resulted in her eating disorder becoming worse and her having to leave the school and um, try it a new school because it was so devastating for her. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is Facebook depression. They actually have a term for it. I don't know if it's going to be in our new DSM-5R when they revise it or something, but it's defined as depression that develops when preteen and teens spend a great deal of time on social media sites and then it begin to exhibit classic symptoms of depression. Um, acceptance by and contact with peers is an important element of adolescent life. So, I mean, they're actually starting to define this, that they're finding that these kids are getting so depressed, they're feeling isolated, they're feeling alone, and if any of them have been bullied, you know, how, how horrible that is for them. So again, the study by Rideout in 2010, they found that teens that are the heaviest users of social media report being less content and more likely to report that they're getting in trouble a lot at school, that they're sad, they're unhappy, and that they're often bored. And that's been just not even with social media, but they, they've talked about our internet use in general with this younger generation, they're getting so bored now because they want information so quick, they don't want to wait for things, they want to see new images. Another um, kind of risk for social media that really concerns me that my patients don't seem as concerned about is their digital footprint. So again, they're posting things on sites, they're not blocking who's viewing these, and then these things are um, then I had a, recently a patient that a college coach viewed some of her images on her Instagram and then she was asked to leave the team. And she knew that those images would get her in trouble, but I think she did not really think that the coach would view or someone would tell the coach about this. So I love this cartoon um, that's coming up next. I think it kind of shows us um, what, what goes on, especially if we're applying for a job. And, and I hate to admit it, but I have Googled people 
before um, that have applied for jobs and, and kind of look to see what was out there. And so I think this younger generation doesn't think about that happening. Um, the next risk I want to talk about is kind of the, the advertising and that goes on on social media. And, and again, not my poor daughter, she'd be so unhappy to know I'm talking about her so much and making fun of her. But um, she watches all these bloggers and she'll come tell me, oh mom, this blogger was just talking about this mascara that she loves and I need to get it because it, I guess it's amazing. And I said, well honey, did you know that blogger is paid to blog about that mascara? And she goes, no, she's not mom, she's just sharing her opinion. And so again, I think they don't even understand um, that these bloggers are, that, you know, they're being paid by these advertisers. I have a patient that blogs about healthy eating, and I'll talk about that a little bit when I get to my healthy living blogs. Um, but she has a full-on eating disorder, but advertisers are paying her to blog about their products because she has so many followers on her blog site. So again, if, if, if they see it on social media, I think they believe that it's true and it's accurate and that. And so the biggest risk for social media when it comes to our clientele in particular, the eating disorder population, is the social comparison. And, and that is what the research is showing that social comparison increases, you know, leads to body dissatisfaction. And for a lot of our patients, that's what they're doing. They're comparing themselves to others on the internet. They're looking at these images and it's becoming very triggering for them. This study I thought was pretty interesting. They looked at Hispanic girls um, aged 10 to 17 and they examined um, media exposure and found that peer competition and social media use were the strongest predictors um, of the body dissatisfaction. And, and if, if you work, you know, of course, with eating disorder populations, that's what you find. So now we're going to talk about Facebook. And again, I know um, that for our younger populations, they don't use Facebook because that, they say that's what their parents use and, and they don't even want to be on it. Or I guess that's what they say their grandparents use now. But we're going to talk about Facebook and how, how it's used and, and what the research is really showing us. So college students, the most recent research is saying, showing that college use students are on Facebook an average of 100 minutes a day. The main use for Facebook is posting and viewing pictures. And then some of the most popular apps on Facebook are like the Plump and the Skinny Booth app. So this is literally where you can, of course, post a picture of yourself and alter it. And I had a patient. That, that did this in the past year and she had posted a picture of herself um, on average I would guess probably a hundred pounds thinner than she actually was. She posted that picture on social media and she reached out to her peers asking for help and support saying that she was going to be readmitted into treatment and of course everyone supported her and reached out and so when she came into treatment I asked her why she did that and of course she told me the app that she did and how she did it but she told me she did it because she thought if she posted a normal weight picture of herself that no one would think she deserved to get help so she you know she altered her picture in that hope that people would think she was truly sick enough to deserve treatment. I showed you this because I think it's interesting um, for Facebook use and if you guys are on Facebook I'd love to ask you right now how many friends you have and to see how many of you actually know how many friends you have because for a lot of people they don't know how many friends they have and then if you look 20 percent have over 600 friends and so it's showing you that these probably aren't really true friends and so what you're showing people these might be acquaintances or people that you don't even know and again with our younger generation that's what they're doing so we're going to talk now about this study and some of the main findings. This is a pretty large study looking at Facebook um, done in 2013. And they, they looked at almost 1,100 girls in 8th and ninth grade and did some surveys. So of course they found that 96% of them had interact, internet access in their home. 75% had a Facebook profile. Um, on average they spent 90 minutes a day. 
time spent on the internet was significantly related to the internalization of the thin I, um, I body ideal. So basically, and that's what I did my previous research on, is looking at media use and internalization of that thin bo body ideal. So what they found in the study is the more girls were on the internet, the more they valued the thin body type that's currently out there, and the stronger drive for thinness they had. Some other th interesting things they found in this study kind of have their six main findings is Facebook users scored significantly higher on all body image concerns than non-users. So basically people that were on Facebook had more body image concerns than people that were never on Facebook. And then they found the number of friends and the time spent on social media were significantly associated with increased body image. So again, the more they're on social media and then the more friends they have, it was predicting that they, for, um, that they felt less about themselves and they felt less about their bodies and they weren't happy. This next study um, was done in 2010 and it was done at York University. And this one may not surprise any of the clinicians listening on. Individuals with higher narcissism and lower self-esteem had greater online activity and self-promotional content. And you know, my um, Facebook site, I have, it's more of a public site and then I do have a few friends from high school that are on that that I don't really interact with. And I can tell you that I, I think this is absolutely true, this um, statistic right here. So this next study I think is fascinating because I want you to pay attention to, there it's up on your screen, I want you to pay attention to how long the study was. So it was done in 2013, they had 232 college women. They looked at them for a four week period, so only four weeks, and they found that maladaptive Facebook use, and by maladaptive Facebook use, that means the tendency to seek out negative evaluations and or social comparisons predicted greater eating pathology, which included bulimic behaviors and binge eating. And so maladaptive Facebook use predicted bulimic behaviors four weeks later. So what this is saying, these are um, examples, and I don't see this as much on Facebook, but this maladaptive use they're talking about is what I see a lot on Instagram. And I am a little bit of a helicopter parent, I have to admit. So I have my daughter's Instagram account on my phone, and so I can go on it, and what I see this tendency for girls to do is they post pictures of themselves, and then they ask for comments. They ask to be rated on their hotness or their thinness, or on their outfit. And so that's what this Facebook study is talking about, are women um, posting images and then wanting evaluations about that or comparing themselves. And again, in just four weeks, they found that that behavior strongly predicted eating disorders. And so it, it makes me think, well, what if you were on Facebook even longer? So the authors of this study, you know, they concluded that e eating pathology is definitely related to more time on Facebook. An interesting thing too they found, if you look at the very end of the slide, that increased internet use is associated with a decreased need to exercise. So what this means is people that are on the internet more, obviously we would assume they're exercising less, but they actually feel like they don't need to exercise as much. So I thought that was a pretty interesting component to the study that they found. Um, this next study we're talk about came out in 2014, and these researchers examined 103 middle school and high school girls, and they looked at total Facebook use, specific um, Facebook feature use, this is usually them using apps, weight dissatisfaction, drive for thinness, the thin ideal internalization, and appearance, and then and how much these women self-objectified. So those were all the kind of measures they looked at. And the study found that use of the Facebook photo applications, so not their over, overall Facebook use, correlated the strongest with the weight dissatisfaction, drive for thinness, thin ideal internalization, and self-objectification. So knowing this study, I went into a group, and I was running a group with a lot of our adult residential women, and I asked them 
how many of you alter your photos before you post them and make sure you've airbrush them basically and the entire group raised their hand. Now when I asked the adolescents it was like 50-50 but with a lot of my adult patients this is what they're saying they're doing and they're spending a long time altering their pictures, changing their pictures and you know they make sure that people can't tag them and they make sure that every picture that they select looks a certain way. Um, this, this study too, this is the second part of the study and I love this. They, they had 40 or 84 women and they divided them into two groups. So one group just got to look at Facebook. The other group got to research this adorable cute rainforest cat. So you either had to look at Facebook for 20 minutes or you had to research the rainforest cat. And after just 20 minutes, the people that were on Facebook reported greater body dissatisfaction than those who looked at the cute cat pictures. This was very similar um, results that I found with my research. I had women for just 30 minutes look at images from Vogue, Glamour, Cosmopolitan. And in 30 minutes, their depression was so high, their body dissatisfaction was so high, um, their scores were off the charts. It, it was actually interesting. My, my research committee said that if they knew looking at media would have been so triggering for women, they would have not let me do the, the research. And so we're seeing the same thing with Facebook. Is it's just, it's, it's very, very triggering for our patients. So again, this, this study, kind of this next one, finding similar results. It was done in 2014. But young women using Facebook had significantly more body image concerns than non-users. But in this one, they found their number of their friends and the time spent most on social media, again, was significantly um, contributed to their body disturbances. So asking our patients, how many friends do you have? Or asking them on Instagram, how many followers do you have? Um, it might really kind of show us what's going on. A recent study um, done at Shepherd's Pratt, um, this one, they had 600 subjects and over half reported that Facebook impacted their self-consciousness with regard to appearance, with men reporting the biggest impact. So again, it's not just women that this is impacting, it's men as well. And so the social comparison that's going on, um, the, the images is so triggering to them. So one of the last ones I'm going to talk about is a study from 2014. And again, they found that frequent Facebook use with, was associated greater with disordered eating and that Facebook use was associated with the maintenance of weight and shape concerns and state anxiety compared to other internet use. So I think this one's a little bit different because it's showing that it's creating this anxiety and so many of our patients already suffer and struggle with anxiety. They're going on Facebook and they're feeling far more anxious. So some of these last studies I want to talk about are going to kind of get to some other cultures and then we're going to talk about Dr. Becker's research, what she's finding with social media. So this study in 2011 again found that teen girls spend more time on Facebook. They have higher rates of body image disturbances, higher rates of eating disorders. Um, so it really doesn't matter where they're living that they're experiencing it. And so that's what Dr. Becker found again when she went back to Fiji. And she thought, I'm going to look, you know, I, I knew traditional media really impacted these women. Now I want to see how social media is impacting these women. And she found the women in Fiji are highly impacted by social media and 60% more likely to develop eating disorders if they have access to social media than those girls that don't in Fiji. And so we're seeing that we really can't escape it. And so this next slide, I gave you the reference of this study that she did with 523 women. And again, it, it's just, if, if you have time, I'd highly recommend you find the study and look at it because I think if, if we're seeing these kind of results in Fiji, it's no wonder what's going on here in the U.S. and with the social media use that's, that we're having with our young kids. 
So now I think we'll shift gears a little bit. We're going to talk about healthy living blogs because my patients ask me about these all the time and they truly believe they're true and they believe that all the information on these blogs are completely accurate. So kind of the biggest study out there that I can find was done in 2014. And in order to be a part of this study, the, the bloggers had to have won some kind of award for their blog and it had to have a large viewership. So they selected 21 blogs that kind of met that profile. And what they found from their content analysis of these healthy living blogs that were 24% of the bloggers had an eating disorder, 33% of the bloggers had menstruation or fertility problems, 76% of the bloggers were currently on a diet or had recently dieted, 52% of the bloggers included some form of written, written on their blog site, it was either negative or guilt-inducing messages about food. 86% um, all, let me let you guys catch up really six, 86% of the bloggers were runners and three were CrossFit trainers. 91% of the bloggers had pictures of themselves and 57% used self-objectifying phrases. 57% of the bloggers posted ways to make themselves look thinner. There's actually a whole blog site out there where this woman teaches people how to take pictures of themselves to post on social media to look thinner, and, and that's all she does is blog about it every day and show new poses or new apps and new ways that women can do this. 57% of bloggers mentioned being fat or overweight in some kind of negative term. And again, I have a patient that makes um, a tremendous amount of money, a six-figure income, being a healthy living blogger. She's been profiled on several national televote television talk shows, morning shows about her healthy living blog. She posts recipes every day. She posts a fitness routine every day on this blog. And she is completely, she's anorexic. She doesn't eat any of the food that she posts about any of the recipes. She's not even able to do her fitness routine anymore. Um, but she is one of the top bloggers in the country and she has a lot of followers. And people really believe that what she's, she's blogging about is true. So in speaking to that, I now want to talk about pro-anocytes. And these images I have on the screen are all images that I have taken from pro-eating disorder websites. And so these are kind of the things that our patients are exposed to. I think it's critical as a, as for clinicians, if you're working with the eating disorder population, you need to be asking them if they've visited these sites. Um, I did a story recently with Fox News and they, um, they put a camera behind me and they had me go on Google and I just searched eating disorder help and eating disorder treatment. And within the first page of the results, um, the, the results were showing pro-eating disorder websites. And that's one of the things I'm going to show is that, that these pro-ANA and pro-eating disorder websites are more organized and have higher hits than the treatment centers because these patients are, are getting, the, you know, they're blogging about it, they're putting the information up there, um, and it's, it's all over. And this, again, this one I just posted right there, this is just right off of a pro-anorexia website. So these websites, they provide tips, advice, online community for weight management. Um, they show lots of really kind of sick images. They can sh give graphic detailed instructions of how to binge and purge. They can give information on weight loss. I had a patient, um, she was actually profiled on Entertainment Tonight because her pro-anorexia website had the most followers. And when she came in to treatment, she admitted that she purposely put tips and tricks on her website that she knew could permanently damage other women. If they tried the kind of chemical concoction she was encouraging them to do for weight loss. And when I asked her why she did it, she says, well, I was so miserable in my eating disorder and I viewed all other women as my competition that I wanted them to suffer just as much as I was. 
the good news is is that patients now recovered, but you know how many how many young girls I wonder accessed her site. So this kind of shows you um, search results, but look at the year of the study. It was ten years ago. So can you imagine the search results now if we were searching some of those terms? The other things too um, are some of the, the tips and tricks that are posted. So this study, they did a content analysis of pro-anorexia websites. And they looked at the tips and the tricks um, of nine of the most um, common followed sites. And they said most of them did, you know, restricting calories or how to diet. Some focused on distraction. But 11% were um, directed at lying, concealing symptoms. So my patients, they find out, you know, how to, how to water load on these sites. They find out how to make their labs better. They find out how to manipulate their labs. And so these sites will give them detailed information on how to, how to do that. A study done in 2012, they um, looked at pro-anorexia sites. And of course, you can look at the number of the, the sites and people that viewed the sites. And of 97% were female. The average age was 22. 25% of them were underweight. 21% of them were overweight. 70% had purged, binged, or used laxatives to control their weight. 13% were in treatment. The study found that the use of pro-eating disorder sites was strongly correlated to higher scores on eating disorder pathology measures. It also was correlated with more extreme weight loss behaviors. A lot of my patients tell me they purposely visit these sites to trigger themselves. And so if they feel like they're kind of getting better with their eating disorder, they'll view these sites um, to trigger themselves to kind of go backwards. I think this interview with a 14-year-old anorexia sufferer really kind of shows the power of these sites. This is what she said. I was a few pounds overweight and needed support. I found a great site where everyone gave each other weight loss tips. I shared a photo of myself and got 47 comments, mostly saying how fat I was. It really motivated me. I lost 30 pounds with the help of this site. And so, again, these sites are everywhere. Um, I help parents try to block these sites. The hard thing is, is the hashtags especially on Instagram, and that the hashtags constantly change. And even with our patients, you know, a while ago it was very, very popular, especially during Eating Disorder Awareness Week, for everyone to post like hashtags like hashtag ED strong, hashtag ED recovery. And I found that even those hashtags were then being associated with negative sites and negative pictures. So even when we're trying to support our patients and direct them towards positive things and positive hashtags, you just never know. So a content analysis in 2013 of anorexia nervosa groups on Facebook. So these are groups on Facebook for eating disorders. So they looked at education, self-help, professional help, and pro-ana in terms of motivational aspects um, and social support. So they basically, in this content analysis in 2013, 2013, they said professional sites for helping women with eating disorders were non-existent. If, if basically, if there's a patient out there that was suffering, for them to find a site on Facebook to support them was very, very difficult. But the pro Anna groups were found to be the most active, the best organized, and offered the highest levels of social support. So for some of these patients, these sites became their only lifeline. It was their only connection. And again, some of these sites had some positive information, but it seemed like the positive information was outweighed by the negative information. So here are some examples of some of the negative um, hashtags that are out there. And of course, like, Thinstagram, thigh gap, um, bone spo, um, pretty girls don't eat, skip dinner, um, what should say be thinner. These are examples of what people put on their hashtags. And so then Instagram will like pull the hashtags, but then they just find new ones. And so that's just what we're finding over and over and over with these sites. 
So when looking and helping with social media, the, this, this study in 2014, they, they really wanted to see what teens were doing and how they were getting support. So, so they looked at family, they looked at peers, they looked at online, and they looked at spiritual support. And so research suggests that these sites mainly help with weight loss, tips, and worsening of the disorder. Respondents reported more, they felt more support by online peers with their food issues. So when kids were needing support, they weren't going to their family, they weren't um, going to the peers, they were going online, and that's the number one place they were finding their support. So now I want to talk about selfies really quick, since now that is actually a word in our dictionary. Um, and they say a selfie is taken every single second. And it's now kind of almost like a visual diary. Uh, there's 30 million selfies on Instagram. And they report that 91% of teens report that they have posted a photo of themselves online. And then, of course, they want those comments. And if they don't get enough comments, they re they'll, they'll pull it immediately. So this, this study, again, I think is, is pretty interesting. They looked at 800 men between 18 and 40. And men who posted more photos scored higher on narcissism and psychopathology. And then editing photos were related to narcissism and not psychopathology. So they found that editing photos was also related to higher levels of self-objectification. So this study was just with men. But I know if they did this study with women, they would find the exact same results. Because I think that's what we're seeing is um, posting lots of pictures. And the people that are posting the most pictures are the people feeling the worst about themselves. And I think, again, going to social media to get you know, some kind of positive reinforcement to feel better about themselves. So what can we do to help? How can we kind of stop this? So in 2011, Nita launched Proud to Be Me, and it's an interactive website for teens and young adults to develop healthy attitudes about food, weight, and body image. Individuals also began um, sharing their personal stories, and these are some of the, the positive um, hashtags, but like I want to warn you, some of these hashtags I have seen turn very negative. So the ED recovery, the ED soldier, um, food is fuel, pro-recovery, but I've seen very negative pictures and images associated with some of these hashtags. Last year, Tumblr announced that it would no longer allow users to post, you know, any kind of content that promotes self-harm um, or some of these kind of pro-ANA um, images. Years ago, Yahoo polled in one day 60,000 pro-anorexia websites from their server. And again, they can pull them and they can hope that they don't um, put them back on the servers. But, but these sites, as soon as they pull them, they come back up. Pinterest recently took a step of stopping the search words such as Thinspiration. And they would redirect their users um, to kind of talk about warning that eating disorders um, are not a lifestyle choice. They're a mental disorder that, if left untreated, can cause serious health problems or could even be life-threatening. So again, I think these sites are trying to make a difference. They're trying to help, um, but it's hard to keep up. So as professionals, you know, how can we help? Again, I think parents lack some of the basic understanding of these new forms of communication. So as professionals, I think especially if you're working with young adults, it's critical that we're asking our patients if, we're, if they're on these social media sites and asking them how long they're on these sites. So when my patients leave, I make them kind of create aftercare discharge plans. And in, within their plans, we set specific goals and outline how much inter internet use they can do in general and how much they can be on social media and we put time limits on it and for a lot of them I have them go off of Facebook I even delete their Facebook account with them while they're in treatment because a lot of their friends a lot of the images they have on their Facebook are not healthy so I would ask your patients about that I would see if they're willing to do that I would talk to them about 
that and it's you know for me it's a breath of fresh air because most of my my clients are very willing to do that they want to do that they they want to recover and they know it's the best thing for them so I would definitely encourage them to unfriend and unfollow people that are not healthy for them um, to remove some of their pictures a lot of my patients like to keep their sick pictures up um, is kind of a reminder so encouraging them to take those pictures down to not have those pictures up I think is also um, critical so again we have to be asking them how long they're on it is there a, a television or computer in their bedroom is anyone monitoring them keeping them in common areas I had a parent go as far as to take the bedroom door off her daughter's room because she was on pro anorexia websites they didn't know what she was doing and she needed the internet for her homework and so again trying to monitor it as much as you can checking the privacy settings on their devices devices and their social media apps I went to a, a recent talk for parents on how to you know secure your phone because they're showing that even you know with the teenagers it'll look like it's the calculator app on their phone but it'll really be another app and so they know how to hide all the apps they know how to hide everything they're doing um, and and to make us not aware and so there are some filter softwares that parents can can download that can kind of help them find some of the stuff that they're their teens could be using other things for our teens and again you would think this would be common but having them not do any of those pop-ups and again my poor daughter comes to me all the time because there's some pop-up on her computer where if she just fills out the survey they'll give her a free iPad and she's really convinced that that's going to happen um, and so talking to them about that and then creating I already talked about kind of ground rules about their internet use how often they're on social media and then kind of the stranger danger I am so surprised by how many of my friends will let random people follow them on Instagram will friend request will take friend requests from random people but again so many of these these patients are so eager for attention or for validation that I think that's why they're so vulnerable to this so asking them about that seeing um, seeing if they're who they're friends with who who's following them on these sites who they're messaging you know I talked about when Yahoo pulled those pro um, eating disorder websites off their server well when they went back and, and did an analysis of who was behind those sites they found a large percent of those sites were created by men because it was men seeking images of women and so it was men pretending to be a 14 year old in Kansas struggling with an eating disorder then reaching out to an anorexia sufferer asking her for images and then using those images in negative ways so talking to our patients about who are they sharing these images with um, is critical another thing that recently happened to one of my patients is she posted some pictures online she did not have them watermarked or um, and so the, those images ended up on a diet ad commercial on online and they changed her name but they used her images and there's really nothing now that she can do about that so talking to your patients about that letting them know that once they post that image up there you know it it is up there but we're kind of we're kind of ending on time and I don't know do I have a question okay Oh, okay so the question is what percentage of five-year-old girls diet and the the most recent research and I'll say most recent research but this is from 2006 is 14 percent of little girls are dieting um, at the age of five so I think that is kind of frightening when you think about it and you wonder that that research is now 10 years old and as a parent of an eight-year-old boy I have more parents now talking to me about their sons than their their daughters so yeah it, great question so I think we'll we'll wrap up and so I thank you so much for everyone joining me and then Tamara just has a few announcements thank you
thanks, Nicole. Um, really appreciate everyone participating with us again today. Um, I apologize for the sound issues in the beginning. We, it took us a minute to get it fixed, so thanks for hanging in there with us, um, and hopefully you were able to, to hear the rest um, well. So we got feedback that everything was good from a lot of people saying it was fixed, so hopefully you had a similar experience and, and were able to hear just fine. Um, just a reminder that when we end the seminar, excuse me, when we end the webinar here shortly, uh, an evaluation will pop up immediately. So please watch for that. And if you'll fill that out really quickly, as I indicated at the beginning of the webinar, it's really quick. It's, it's electronic, and it's part of our continuing education certification process. So if you would fill out the evaluation, we'd appreciate it. And then watch for an email um, coming in the next couple of hours uh, that will have a link for you to take the post-test online. And once you successfully complete the post-test, it will automatically generate a certificate of attendance for you. So thank you again for participating, and we look forward to having you join us again next time. Thank you.